Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening for our PA Health Talk program sponsored by Geisinger. This evening, we're pleased to bring you a presentation on conceiving connections. Just as a reminder, we did receive some questions during the registration process that came in, and we'll be sure to address those at the end of the presentation. If you have a question during the program, we invite you to put it into the Q&A box that you'll see at the top of your screen, and we'll get to as many of the questions as we can after the end of our presentation. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you our speakers for the evening, Dr. Jennifer Gell and Lydia Shively. Dr. Gell is the Division Chief of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at Geisinger, and Lydia is a Certified Physician Assistant specializing in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Also joining us this evening is Alyssa Consini. Alyssa is our Operations Manager over all of Geisinger's Specialty Women's Services, and she'll be serving as the moderator for this evening's question and answer session. And just last, before we get started, Dr. Gell, Lydia, and Alyssa are just really great people overall, and we're lucky to have them here at Geisinger and to have their time tonight to talk about conceiving connections and fertility issues. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and we will kick off our program. Great. Thank you, Sarah. I'm, um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Jennifer Gell, and I'm the Director of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility for Geisinger. And what Lydia and I were hoping to achieve tonight is give you an overview of what we do within our practice, and then Lydia specifically, what she's able to do out here in the West. Um, we wanted to start off by telling you a little bit about ourselves and our background. Um, I have been at Geisinger for, gosh, 25 years. I am from Michigan originally, and I did my um, my medical school in Philadelphia and then did my residency at University of Michigan and then my fellowship at UT Southwestern before I came to Geisinger for fertility. And so I've been here, um, I'm primarily in Wilkes-Barre, but as you'll learn in our presentation, we have a big footprint within our service and I spend a lot of time in Danville um, for some of our treatment options that we offer. Hi everybody, my name is Lydia. Um, like Dr. Gell mentioned, um, I'm kind of the primary provider for reproductive endocrinology here in the State College area. Um, I went to Slippery Rock University for both undergrad and PA school. Um, I am originally from this area, so I'm happy to be back here and serving um, patients from my hometown. Um, and yeah, that's about well, yeah, it for me. All right, next, please. So the first thing to understand is what is the definition of infertility? And the definition is that it is failure to conceive after a year of unprotected, well-timed intercourse. And this is really for women who are 35 or under. As you'll see a little bit later, we're gonna talk specifically about women who are, are 35 or older. That definition changes to really six months of well-timed unprotected intercourse. And that's a function of um, aging of the eggs. And with that, it becomes harder, unfortunately, to get pregnant. The reason this year of unprotected intercourse became the definition of infertility is that 90% of couples in the when the female partners 35 or less that were followed for a year became pregnant. And so again, it's failure to conceive after one year of well-timed intercourse. Next. The causes of infertility can be sort of broken down into four main um, causes. The first is female infertility, and that's things like potentially <clears throat> endometriosis that may play a role, ovulatory dysfunction, so women who might have irregular periods. That's about 30% of women. Um, another part can be uh, in women can be tubal factor, so infections that might affect women's fallopian tubes. Um, male infertility accounts for about 30% of causes of infertility, and that can be men who have very low sperm counts. Mixed infertility is about 20% of couples, and that's where there could be a component of female and male infertility. And then most frustratingly, 20% of couples have no obvious explanation for why they're struggling to conceive. Next, please. 
So in an evaluation, we always start with a good history. And what we want to know in the female partner is we want to know about her periods. Does she have regular periods? Does she miss periods? Um, we want to know if she had any history. Did she have a ruptured appendix? Has she had history uh, surgeries for infections? Does she have a history of any sexually transmitted diseases? Does she have a history of having pregnancies? Were they was were they normal pregnancies? Did she have a tubal pregnancy? Was she able to have a vaginal delivery? Does she have a history of repeat miscarriages? And of course, any medications that she may be taking as well as any other medical problems that might impact her ability to conceive or might impact the pregnancy. Next, please. The same is true of the male partner. We want to make sure we understand his surgical history. Specifically, has he had any sort of urologic procedures that might affect his sperm count or his or his ability to father a pregnancy? Has he had any sort of sexually transmitted diseases? Does he have any medical issues like ejaculatory dysfunction or erectile dysfunction? Is he taking any medications and has he fathered any pregnancies? One thing to note, however, is that even though a male partner has had previous pregnancies or fathered previous pregnancies, that does not mean that currently he has a normal sperm count. And so part of our evaluation always, and we'll talk about this again a little bit, is making sure that at current time there's still a normal semen analysis. Next, please. So our evaluation really comes down to three main things. We wanna assess ovulation and make sure that our female partner is ovulating and testing to make sure that there's nothing that could be affecting her ability to ovulate. We wanna make sure that there is no male factor, that our male partners have adequate moving sperm, and we always wanna make sure that fallopian tubes are open and that the uterus is normal. Next, please. So the first question is, how do we evaluate ovulation? And I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but this is what a basal body temperature chart looks like, or BBT. And I'm showing you this because we don't want you to do these anymore. The problem with these is if you're looking at it where that says ovulation, what makes the temperature chart goes up, go up is progesterone, which rises after ovulation. So these are, to do these for a month is, it gives you useful information, but the main problem with this is it doesn't allow us to predict when ovulation is gonna happen before it happens. And so to do these are really, really time intense. You gotta take your temperature with a special thermometer first thing in the morning before you roll out of bed. And so it becomes really somewhat of a hassle and even makes you focus more and more on this whole fertility thing where you're really not getting information that allows you to predict when to get when is the best time to time intercourse. So I think they're useful maybe for a month, but not even that much. So we really don't even use these anymore. Next. Ovulation predictor kits can be useful, but you have to be careful with these as well. The first thing to remember at the, is these are not absolutely 100% accurate. And so just because you see a surge, or if you don't see a surge, that doesn't absolutely mean you're ovulating or you're not ovulating. The other important thing about these ovulation predictor kits is that you need to use one that is easy to interpret. And a lot of the ones that you can find have pink or purple lines. Those can be really hard to, to um, interpret. And so what you want is something that's blue because you can read the lighter one much easier, see when the light is lighter than the darker one, which is much easier to interpret. The main thing, getting back to what we talked about initially about that well-timed intercourse, is you don't want to rely solely on an ovulation predictor kit to time when to have intercourse. You want to make sure you're having frequent intercourse during the time frame where you might be ovulating. The other thing to keep in mind with these kind of tests is they're really only useful in women who have regular predictable cycles. So in women who have irregular periods, 
you're never going to be able to really accurately figure out when you're ovulating based on these testing because it can be all over the place. And so that becomes an indication to see a fertility specialist earlier just because it's going to be harder when to predict when to time intercourse in order to try to get pregnant. And so what we really do when we're talking about evaluating for ovulation is when we're doing an evaluation, what we're looking for is the potential of outside influences that might be affecting ovulation. And that's making sure with blood work that thyroid is normal, another brain hormone called prolactin is normal. In some situations, there's no evidence of insulin resistance with lab evaluation. And oftentimes measuring a fertility test called anti-Mullerian hormone or AMH, which helps us predict the ability of the ovary to respond to fertility medicine. Next. So the next part of an evaluation is tubal patency testing um, and overall uh, uterine evaluation. So the main things we're looking for is that the uterine cavity is normal, that there's no fibroids or polyps that are affecting the lining of the uterus that could affect an embryo implanting and growing. And then also uh, making sure that the fallopian tubes themselves are open so that we know that egg can get to where it needs to be um, to fertilize and implant um, in the right spot. Um, so the test that we um, do, uh, the first one there is hysterosalpingogram or HSG, FemView, and then the last one is laparoscopy and chromoperturbation. Um, the HSG is the test that I primar primarily do um, out here in our Western region. Um, and that test involves um, putting a small catheter in the uterus and we fill the uterus up with fluid that has dye in it um, done under X-ray. And um, under the x-ray, we see that dye fill up the uterine cavity um, and, and making sure that it's smooth, that there's no fibroids or polyps. And then also hopefully see that dye fill up the fallopian tubes and spill out into the belly, which tells us that the tubes are open. Um, depending on the results of the HSG, um, um, depending on, you know, if we see an occlusion of the fallopian tubes, um, sometimes we will do the laparoscopy and chromoperturbation to confirm um, because that is where we go in through the belly uh, with a camera. And then um, the chromoperturbation part is where we inject dye through the uterus. And then via the camera in the belly, we're able to visualize um, those fallopian tubes to see if that dye comes through. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of a normal HSG. Um, you can see um, it's nicely labeled there um, where um, the uterus is smooth, that there's no fibroids or polyps, and you can see on either side the fallopian tubes um, filled with fluid. That's kind of the stringy um, appearance there. And then at the very end is where the, the dye is spilling out into the belly. So this, this HSG is normal. Next slide, please. This um, is showing a blocked fallopian tube. Um, so again, you can see a normal uterine cavity at the bottom there. This one looks a little bit different. That one has a balloon inside the uterus, which is why it's kind of curved at the bottom. Um, but then you're seeing on her right side, which is actually the left part of the picture, that that tube is open. It's spilling out to the belly. And on that, um, on her the right side, which is the patient's left, that um, the uh, tube um, does not fill with dye, uh, meaning that it is occluded. Um, <clears throat> there, the HSGs um, can um, appear to be occluded um, when it's not actually occluded, which is you know why you know the laparoscopy is is an option uh, to confirm. Um, the uterus doesn't love to have um, fluid injected through, and so sometimes it does um, contract, and that uh, appears to be an occlusion uh, similar to this image. Um, so an option would be to do the laparoscopy to confirm. Next slide, please. And these are a couple of other um, um, abnormal HSGs. Uh, that first picture on the left is showing a polyp, which is where the arrows are pointing into. Um, and that's just kind of where we can see that the dye doesn't uh, fill up the, the uterus. And so it's not smooth. We see that little bubble there, which is a, is a polyp. Um, endometrial polyps um, can affect embryos implanting and growing, um, but they are uh, almost always benign and very easily um, surgically removed. Um, and that second image on the right is showing um, either 
uh, a septum or a bicornuate uterus where the um, person was born with a, a uterus that has a defect um, in that top part, um, which would require a little bit further evaluation. Next slide. Um, this is um, a fem view is an, a kind of newer way to see if tubes are open and this is done with ultrasound. And so what we do with this is it's similar to what Lydia was explaining with putting a catheter up inside the uterus. But in this situation, we put a catheter, catheter in and then we have a device that generates bubbles with water. And so with ultrasound, what we're looking for is to see the bubbles circulating by the ovaries. The problem with this test is on ultrasound, you can't actually see fallopian tubes. So if we don't see bubbles, it doesn't mean that the tubes are blocked. It means the test is inconclusive. And so this test is really only done for women who have no risk factors for tubal disease, um, such as previous tubal pregnancy, previous infections, um, those kind of things that we're pretty certain the tube is open um, because otherwise, we can't say with certainty if we're not seeing bubbles, if it's blocked or it's just a, it's just because we're not seeing it on ultrasound. Um, I think my next slide is actually showing the bubbles circulating. So next slide, please. So this is what the FemView looks like, where you can see the bubbles in the uterus, and then you follow them out, and you can see the bubbles kind of coming out and going all the way towards the end, um, which is following them out through the tube. So this woman actually has an open fallopian tube. And so that's the difference, as you can see, from what we were seeing with the x-ray. All right, next slide. This is the laparoscope that Lydia was referring to, and this is blue dye. So what we're looking at at the top of the picture is the uterus, and then on either side are the fallopian tubes, and that blue is because the tubes are open, that blue dye is coming out of the fallopian tubes. So this woman on laparoscopy is noted to have normal open fallopian tubes. Next. The other way to evaluate the inside of the uterus is with 3D ultrasound. And so these are images of 3D ultrasound. And it's the same idea. We're putting water up inside the uterus to separate the lining, and then we can do a 3D ultrasound to get a 3D image of what the inside of the uterus looks like. This is a normal picture of what the inside of the uterus looks like on 3D ultrasound. Next. These are showing, and it's kind of a side view, but these are showing polyps, actually probably a fibroid actually. Um, that bottom image, kind of turn your head to the side and you can see that really round thing is a, a fibroid at the, at the corner of the uterus. Next. And this last one is showing a polyp, which is that little thing hanging down and then the septum is the arrow. So that 3D ultrasound is showing two different things um, going on with the inside of the uterus. Next. So the semen analysis um, is, is an important test to make sure that we have adequate moving sperm. Um, here um, in the State College area, um, our patients do these over at Mount Nittany Medical Center, um, where you collect the sample at home um, and take it to the lab to be evaluated. Um, it requires two or three days prior um, to providing the specimen um, of abstinence, so no intercourse, um, two to three days prior to providing that specimen. Um, but we also don't want it going longer than seven days. Um, going longer than seven days, there can be dead sperm um, and other debris in the sample. So to get the most accurate representation of, of the uh, sperm, um, it has to be a, kind of in a, in a good window um, of you know two to five days um, and then collect the sample within an hour or, or I'm sorry you schedule an appointment to drop off the specimen and then the, the specimen has to be collected within an hour of that appointment time and then uh, keeping it body temperature either under the armpit or between the legs on the way to the lab um, to ensure that the sperm um, stay at the, at the optimal temperature um, so that it's a most accurate um, representation of the sperm. Um, 
just because um, you know we have reference values for the semen analysis, if um, you know the sample has numbers that are lower than what we would hope for doesn't mean that the um, male patient is infertile. It doesn't mean that he can't father a pregnancy, just the same as if he does have normal sperm, doesn't necessarily mean um, that he's capable of, of um, you know, fertilizing and, and creating a pregnancy. Next slide. So these are the uh, reference values. Um, so we look at the specimen as a whole. We look at the volume um, of the sample, and then mainly we look at the density of the sperm or the concentration or the count of sperm. We look at the overall motility, which is kind of our best quality marker for sperm, um, looking at how many are, are moving. Um, and then more specifically, we look at how many of them are, or, or what, what is the overall um, where they're moving forward. And that is, you know, a marker of good quality sperm. Um, so that's why that is, a, is um, also specific. And then we're also looking at the morphology, which is the shape of the sperm um, and making sure that we have, you know, normal shaped sperm um, that are look best for, for fertilizing an egg. Um, so the two main things that we look at are the concentration and then the motility, and we multiply those numbers by each other to get that bottom number, which is the total modal count. Um, and a normal total modal count is 10 million moving sperm per milliliter of sample collected, and that is for best chances of conceiving through intercourse. Um, when we have uh, anything greater than 10, it is for best chance of conceiving through intercourse. When we have lower numbers, um, such as 5 to 10 million, is where we consider doing something like intrauterine inseminations or IUI, or really low numbers like 1 to 2 million, that is um, where IVF or in vitro fertilization is best chance of success. So that's, that's how the semen analysis kind of directs um, the treatment plan. Next slide. So this just is a graph that kind of, again, shows the importance of the female partner's age on, on the ability to conceive. And the problem for women is women are born with the number of eggs they have for their entire life. And so what happens is women start to get towards the end of reproductive age, and we're talking really after 37, the eggs that remain as women get towards the end of reproductive age are less likely to have the correct number of chromosomes. And so when that egg is fertilized, the embryo that results doesn't have the correct number of chromosomes. That's called aneuploidy, and that's what increases as women get older. And so what happens, unfortunately, is that embryo that doesn't have the correct number of chromosomes either can't attach and grow, so it becomes harder to get pregnant, it attaches but can't continue to grow, so the rate of miscarriage goes up, or that's why there starts to be a higher chance of having babies with things like Down syndrome. And so the, the reason I bring this up again is it's important in women who are over 35 that you really, if it's six months of well-timed intercourse and you're not pregnant, that I think is an important time frame where to start pursuing more of a fertility evaluation. Next slide, please. This is just a slide of what polycystic ovarian syndrome, what the polycystic ovaries look like um, on laparoscope. So this is a laparoscopic image. The top darker red thing is the uterus, and then those bottom round whiter looking things are polycystic ovaries. And this is a common, about 10% of women, reproductive age women have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And this is a clinical diagnosis made in women who don't have regular periods because they don't ovulate every month and have signs of excess male hormone. And so again, in women who don't have regular ovulatory cycles and don't get a period every month, if your cycles are wacky and you don't get them every month, maybe six months or so of trying to get pregnant, and if you haven't conceived or you're unable to have well-timed intercourse, that too would be a time where to seek assistance with a fertility specialist. Next slide, please. And this is a laparoscopic picture of endometriosis. This is also sort of um, another condition that can affect fertility. And what you're seeing here, all those little dark spots, that's actually spots of endometriosis. And endometriosis, unfortunately, can only be diagnosed surgically. 
and the the indication for surgery in women who are trying to get pregnant really becomes more pain management. What we have found in women who have endometriosis, if we don't remove it surgically, it does not tend to decrease success rates with our standard fertility treatment. Um, but if you know you have it, it also is something that can impact fertility. And so that too might be a reason to see a fertility specialist maybe sooner rather than later. Next slide, please. So the treatment um, is based off of the, the overall picture, you know, based off the evaluation. So, you know, we're looking at the, the labs and looking at the, the ovulation function. We're looking at the HSG. Do we have normal tubes and a normal uterus? And then, um, you know, the semen analysis and how that plays a role. Um, the kind of most conservative place that we start is using oral fertility medications like clomiphene citrate. The other name of that is um, Clomid or um, Letrozole, which the other name is Femara. Um, and those medications are used to optimize ovulation, potentially get you to ovulate more than just one egg, potentially two or three. Um, and then using a second medication, um, you know, we can kind of force ovulation to happen at a somewhat specific time. Um, that way we can, you know, have you time intercourse or time and insemination relative to that. And so we're increasing chances of success by optimizing ovulation, making ovulation super efficient, um, potentially getting you to ovulate more than just one egg. Uh, to give sperm a couple extra targets, um, and then tightening up the timing of sperm and egg being in the same place at the same time. Um, gonadotropins are our injectable medications that um, we use for IVF. Um, we can also use those if the oral medications don't produce, you know, a, a good response from the ovaries. Um, and then, as we mentioned, you know, we do intrauterine inseminations or IUI, um, and then in vitro fertilization or IVF, which we'll go into detail here. Next slide, please. So intrauterine insemination, um, as I said before, we do this um, oftentimes because the male factor, the, the semen analysis, um, you know, has lower numbers. Um, or we can also do it if, you know, timing intercourse is not successful. Um, and so each part, each treatment option is going to be best successful on the first three or four attempts, um, where research shows that if we're not successful, you know, with, uh, with each treatment option on, on the fourth attempt, that, um, you know, moving on to the next step uh, is indicated for, um, you know, being most financially efficient and also time efficient. Um, and so intrauterine inseminations are where, um, you know, the male partner would provide a specimen um, and we wash it here. Um, and I can do this at Grace Woods. Um, and then using a catheter, we put all of the good sperm um, directly into the uterus to get it closer to where the eggs are. So that's how we're increasing chances of success. Next slide. This just shows where we do IVF, which is our laboratory is in Danville. So patients that need IVF, their part portion of their procedures are done in Danville, the actual egg retrieval. And when we put the embryo back into the uterus, we do that in Danville. Next slide. And so IVF briefly involves using medications to make the ovaries make multiple follicles, which are the fluid filled sac where the eggs are. We then retrieve the eggs by putting a needle through the vagina into the ovary to get the eggs out. The eggs are then fertilized with the sperm, and then the embryos that result go into the uterus through the cervix. Next slide. This is just showing how we monitor the response to the medications with ultrasound, and you can see on that image on the top, the ultrasound, the follicle is the fluid filled dark circle. And you can see the, the little needle that we have put into the follicle to aspirate the fluid out. And then the laboratory looks through that fluid to find the egg. Next slide. This is how the egg is fertilized in the lab. We take one moving sperm under the microscope and actually inject it into the egg. The big round thing is the egg, and that you can see that sharp thing, that sharp needle looking thing is a pipel that has the sperm. Next slide. 
and then the embryos grow in the laboratory from the initial fertilized egg, which is the one cell embryo, through to day two, day three, day, day three, excuse me, day three is an eight to cell, eight to 10 cell embryo, and then the blastocyst is what is then transferred into the uterus. Next slide. And so again, we just want to remind that the, mis the mission of our Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility is really to provide exceptional and comprehensive fertility services with warmth and compassion without significant travel. Next slide. So this is just a brief overview of everything we've discussed um, of all of the services that we we provide. So the evaluation and treatment um, of fertility problems, ovulation induction, which is um, you know using those oral fertility medications to optimize ovulation, uh, surgical management of endometriosis, um, pelvic adhesive disease, which can go along with endometriosis or having had um, previous pelvic infections, fibroids, and, and uterine anomalies. Um, uh, Dr. Gell um, does a lot of these surgical management, but we also have GYN surgeons out here that work with me closely um, in the Western region to also provide um, those surgical services. Um, the assisted reproductive technology, um, you know, the IUIs and IVF um, in Danville, third party reproduction that's using, you know, donor eggs or donor sperm, um, and then also gestational carriers. Um, fertility preservation, um, so that, that is for women who want to freeze their eggs, um, and then LGBTQ uh, fertility services as well. So that's, again, using donor um, egg, donor sperm, um, and can, gestational carriers as well. Next slide. So this is just a picture of Grace Woods. It looks a little bit different right now. We're kind of going under some construction, um, adding a, a, a new wing, um, but that's just a picture of Grace Woods here. Next. And here's Lydia. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. We'll turn it back over for questions. Thank you, Dr. Gell. Thank you, Lydia. Appreciate the information and the presentation. Um, so at this point, what we are going to do is turn the program over to Alyssa. We are going to take a look at the questions that have come in during the registration process, things that we were submitted ahead of time. And Dr. Gell and Lydia, if you wouldn't mind um, answering those for us, that would be great. Okay, we don't have any submitted questions yet, but I'm going to go ahead and start the questions that were submitted before. So the quest first question, I don't have many eggs left. Can I still have a baby or is there a medication that I could take to help? So, um, you know, we can't really know if a woman has um, how many eggs a woman has left at any any certain point. Um, the best test for this is that AMH or anti-mullerian hormone, um, which is a hormone that's produced by the, the cells that surround each egg. So the more eggs you have, the more of this hormone being produced. There's no normal for that test, um, but above one is reassuring that if we got to the point of using fertility medications, that we'd have good response from the ovaries. Um, and less than 0.2 is a very poor predictor of response. Um, so, you know, even having a low AMH doesn't mean you can't uh, be pregnant or can't conceive. Um, it just predicts kind of response to treatment. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else to add, Dr. Gal? No. Okay. So question number two, what fertility services are offered for gay male couples pursuing gestational surrogacy? Yeah, so we, um, we do offer those services. We do not provide gestational carriers. And so the process for that becomes, um, working usually with family attorneys that are the ones that can help match to a gestational carrier. And so once the, the main portion of this is really the contractual portion in order to kind of find your gestational carrier. Of course, before you can use the gestational carrier, you, you have to create embryos. And so creating embryos involves using an egg donor. And the way we use 
egg donors now are from frozen egg banks. And so the egg bank that we use primarily is Fairfax Egg Bank. And you're actually purchasing a cohort of eggs that are frozen and shipped to us. They're then thawed and fertilized with a partner sperm. The embryos that result are then frozen, and then you have the embryo to put into the gestational carrier's uterus. The gestational carrier has then had her lining prepared with hormones in order to be receptive to that embryo. So there's a lot of moving pieces with that. Um, the, the time sort of constraint is, is really getting the gestational carrier. So a lot of our couples that do this create the embryos because they can stay frozen kind of indefinitely and then work towards, once they have their embryos created, really work towards a gestational carrier. Um, so that is, you know, the kind of the moving pieces for that. Anything else I forgot? So, you know, you, you would have a consultation with me to kind of go over the initial steps, um, you know, testing uh, different things that we have to test, doing a semen analysis, and um, we would work together to um, have you see genetics, um, talk about um, different genetic testing um, so that you could, op you know, choose the best compatible uh, donor egg. Um, and then we would coordinate, you know, creating those embryos in Danville. Thank you. Um, the third question, what fertility services does GHP cover for gay male couples looking to conceive via gestational surrogacy? So really the, you know, the insurance questions are best for your insurance company and, and calling them um, and asking what, what sort of services that they cover. Um, and we have, you know, procedure codes and things like that that we were able to provide um, to see kind of what fertility services, and this is in general, um, not just specific to um, using the donor eggs. Um, um, but so, yeah, so that's, that, that's the answer is to reach out to insurance companies, unfortunately. Thanks, uh, Lydia. And I think, you know, everyone's everyone's plans are different and that's generally why, even if it is the same. So say it is a GHP plan, everyone is so different that it is hard for us on the clinical side to know exactly what precisely is covered. So I think that's great advice. <clears throat> Um, we did have a question come through in the chat, so I think I'm going to ask that before I continue with the ones that were pre-submitted. At what point would you recommend considering donor eggs? This is for a 39-year-old female who has used donor sperm for five unsuccessful attempts of IUI, planning to undergo FET with only embryo after egg retrieval. Okay, so this is this is a little bit of a complicated question because um, I would definitely want to see you know your history and kind of the evaluation that you underwent um, to see you know what what influences you have on fertility. Um, you know, as Dr. Gell mentioned, you know, age um, does play a role, and more so when we get past age 37 um, on the egg quality, and um, you know after you know as we get older that mechanism by how those eggs go through the process of maturing becomes a little defective um, and so that's where we end up with the eggs that have too much or too little genetic information so when we look at women who've gone through the process of ivf at age 37 the chances of ending with an embryo that has the correct number of chromosomes is about um 50%, and at age 42, it drops to about 12%, and then beyond age 45, it's really 0%. Um, and that's, again, you, just using um, assisted reproductive technology. So, you know, um, you know, that's kind of the biggest factor in success um, where, you know, the consideration for using donor egg, donor eggs are collected from women who are under the age of 35, um, so they're much higher, higher um, chance of being chromosomally normal, 99% um, chance, you know, with, with using um, IVF and, and creating embryos with those um, donor eggs. Um, so it definitely has a higher chance of being being successful because um, of that chromosomal factor. Um, I just, one thing to add is you, you have to remember with IVF that each cycle can be completely different. And so one of the things that we look at 
is, you know, how did you respond to the fertility medicine in that in that cycle? Is there um, a way to improve or change the stimulation that might end up with a different cohort of eggs? And the cohort of eggs that are stimulated from cycle to cycle can be completely different, where you might have a cycle where you only have, you know, unfortunately one embryo, but the next time you do it, you might have four or five embryos that end up being euploid. And I think that's the frustration with this is one cycle does not always necessarily predict the outcome of the next cycle. And so that's some of the decisions we look at when we, we would gather, have to gather kind of all the information. What is your AMH? How did you respond to the fertility medicine? How many embryos did you start off with? You know, kind of gathering all that information to really look to see is it worth trying stimulating you again versus looking at donor egg? And even, unfortunately, you do all that and you have a euploid embryo and it's still, unfortunately, not 100%. And so I think that's the hardest thing about IVF is going through all of this and still not having 100% success. Thank you. Okay, we have another question. Can a woman still have a chance to conceive a child at 50 years old? I understand there are medical treatments that are allowing for older women to conceive. Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, the chances of, of having an embryo that has a correct number of chromosomes in a woman older than 45 um, going through the process of IVF is nearly zero. So, and, and that doesn't mean that a woman over the age of 45 cannot conceive. Um, it just means that using fertility treatments doesn't necessarily increase chances of success. So really when we get past the age of 45, that's where, um, you know, as far as where we would come in to improve your chances of success um, would be suggesting using donor egg, um, which is, you know, much higher success rate again because of that chromosomal factor. There are actually no reported pregnancies in women using their own eggs for IVF after 45. And so in all women after 45, we only recommend donor egg for IVF. Thank you. I think kind of along um, the same topic, um, the question at what point should a woman consider using donor eggs? That would be 45 based off of that information. Is that correct? It kind of along with that, um, the patient previous, the 39 year old, you know, it's it's weighing your own individual um, kind of the, the treatments that you've gone through and going through the risk versus the benefit and kind of weighing the options of what's going to be most worth it to you as far as are you willing to accept the risk of proceeding with your own eggs, knowing how you've responded before versus using donor egg, which would probably have higher chance of success. But again, like Dr. Gal said, it's still not 100%. So um, the age 45 is more of a cutoff of, you know, how we're going to help is using donor egg past that age. Um, but we do use it in younger women um, kind of based off individual, you know, evaluations. Thank you. What age is it impossible to conceive? So, if, you know, again, over the age of 45, it's much more unlikely to conceive. You can still conceive um, on your own, um, but much, much less likely, you know, again, because of the chromosomal issues. So I don't know if there's like a hard cutoff, but really, you know, past age 50, it's probably very, very. I think, you know, once women have so once women have not had a period for a year because of menopause, that is definitely, there's no chance of pregnancy after that. Um, I don't have statistics at the, my fingertips for women who are trying to get pregnant on their own, not using fertility treatment, what the chance of pregnancy is each month, but um, it is after 45, even at that point, it becomes very, very low, probably less than 1% per, per month. Fertility in normal fertility in women who are less than 38 each month. So this is women who have no trouble getting pregnant. Normal fertility in when the female partner is, is 38 or less is 18%. That's what normal fertility is. And so, you know, it is probably 
between zero and 1% for women who are over 45. Thank you. How, um, how do you know when a woman is fertile and when to see a specialist? I think you covered some of this in the beginning of the talk, but um, you know, as, as it relates to when to see fertility, do you mind just reviewing that again? Yeah, so there's there's no one test that we can do that's going to tell you, are you fertile or are you not fertile? Um, because it is a combination of all of these things that we're evaluating, the uterus, the tubes, the, the labs, the semen analysis. It's more of the couple as a whole rather than, you know, one individual partner. Um, the sorry, could you repeat the second part of the question? Um, when should they see a specialist? Oh, yeah. So that, you know, like Dr. Gell had mentioned before, you know, under the age of 35, um, 12 months of well-timed intercourse um, is where, you know, we recommend, you know, seeing a fertility specialist. Um, whereas, you know, over the age of 35 or anyone of any age with any known kind of, you know, uh, ovulatory dysfunction, which is having, you know, irregular periods, PCOS, um, confirmed endometriosis, you know, really six months of trying, that's that's where a fertility evaluation is indicated. Thank you. Um, you're probably going to laugh at me for how I'm how I'm not going to pronounce these um, maybe medications correctly, but how well does OVA O V A S I T O L <laughs> or and or Inositol. Thank yep, you. Yep. Thank you. Balance your ho your hormones and increase fertility. Yeah. So ovocetol and inositol and and uh, all, there's multiple different types of inositol. Um, those are supplements, and so supplements aren't regulated by the FDA, and and because of that, they're not well researched or well studied, and so there's not you know great evidence for you know fertility supplements like these um, but you know for the inositols they do have you know more evidence than than say some others um, that you know when when we you know the point of those part supplements in particular um, are thought to kind of help with insulin resistance and so they're often you know suggested for women who have PCOS in which insulin insulin resistance is very highly correlated with having PCOS um, and so, you know, the those supplements um, aim to um, help with that insulin resistance, which can in turn um, potentially help with creating more regular uh, menstrual cycles, meaning more regular ovulation. Um, so it's definitely, you know, something that's not going to be harmful to take, but um, and, and can help in some cases. Um, it's just something that's not, you know, super heavily researched, so we don't have very strong recommendations where we, you know, recommend everyone to take them. Thank you. Um, this is somewhat of a specific question, so I'm going to read it here slowly. Uh, I have PCOS, tried timed intercourse with Femera and a trigger shot with no luck. Can't afford to continue with fertility treatments. Are there any at home supplements or something you could recommend? Yeah, so so that kind of goes along with the, the inositol, the myo inositol, those, those are often recommended for women who have PCOS. Um, you know, other, other things that, um, uh, that you could try that are unrelated to kind of direct fertility intervention, something like, like metformin, um, which metformin is a medication that's uh, um, used to treat that insulin resistance. Um, but other things to kind of, you know, help improve fertility in women with PCOS, um, oftentimes, you know, with that insulin resistance, um, you know, O overweight or obesity is kind of associated with that. So, um, you know, working to kind of optimize weight, which can um, in turn improve fertility and improve ovulation, which can improve not only chances of success of conceiving on your own, but also chances of conceiving using fertility treatment. So, um, and this kind of goes back to the other specific question of, you know, we, you know, in, in your case, we would look at, you know, your history, um, and your response to to the FAMARA um, was the response kind of optimized with the FAMARA and you still didn't have success or um, could things have been you know changed around to you know improve your response to the FAMARA um, to then you know improve chances of of, um, of conceiving you can add on that 
No, I mean, unfortunately, there's with the oral medications, there's two oral medications. And so sometimes if the letrozole Famara doesn't work, we might try the, you know, Clomid and try that and see if we get a better response. I think, you know, one of the problems for anybody with um, timing intercourse or an IUI cycle is that we really don't know what happens downstream. So even in a monitored cycle, even though we see a follicle, we don't even know is there actually an egg in that follicle. We don't know if it's a mature egg. We don't know anything about sperm egg interaction and if an embryo is even created. And so that's part of the problem is, is that we don't know any of that. So even though we see that you're responding based on a follicle on ultrasound, we don't know if any of that other stuff is happening. And that's why for anybody, IVF gives the greatest likelihood of success because it's the only treatment at the end we know we've created an embryo. But as far as oral medications, like Lydia said, sometimes it's changing it around. It's making sure the dosing is adequate, making sure we're triggering at the appropriate time. And then also, you know, making sure that there are, that couples are doing whatever they can to enhance their own fertility and enhancing your own fertility is being non-smokers, you know, working at getting to a more normal body weight. Those are the two things that couples can do that can really enhance their own fertility. Thank you. Um, related to, you know, cost and payment, how long does the process start take, uh, start uh, the IVF process take start to finish and how does payment work? So really the, the IVF process from, you know, an initial consult with me to um, do all of the pre-cycle testing and then going through, um, you know, the stimulation period, egg retrieval, creating embryos, preparing the lining of the uterus, and then doing an embryo transfer. Um, all of that kind of start to finish could be anywhere from four to six months. Um, really, everything started with a period. So oftentimes, you know, we're waiting for a period to start, which, you know, is a month to month kind of basis. Um, so, so about four to six months. Um, and then um, payment wise, payment for IVF, you know, through Geisinger is all upfront. Um, so um, it's, you know, working with your insurance to see if they have any coverage um, and then going from there. Thank you. And then um, one question, I think this may be the last one. So if there's any other questions from our attendees, you feel free to put them in the Q&A. For the last pre-submitted question, um, what type of clients would benefit from genetic counseling in general? In general, most and all patients would benefit from, from genetic counseling. Um, so uh, we have a really fabulous genetic counselor, Alexis, who um, meets with you um, to discuss uh, carrier screening, uh, which is a blood test to look to see if you carry any recessive genes, um, whether it's you and your partner or you and then you're looking at um, using donor eggs or donor sperm. Um, the carrier screening looks at those recessive genes and if you and your partner, if you and a, and a donor um, share the same recessive gene, the chances of an embryo or a baby being affected by that recessive disorder is 25%. Most common is like cystic fibrosis. Um, so, you know, anyone can benefit from, from, you know, knowing, knowing if you carry any of those recessive genes and then kind of being able to utilize that, um, especially in the setting of IVF, where we can actually test embryos um, for, for those genetic um, conditions to then, you know, better select um, embryos to put back that are not affected by, you know, that kind of disorder. Um, she also goes, um, we'll see every one of our IVF patients to go over the um, genetic testing to look at the embryos and their chromosome number. That's called PGTA or pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy um, and that aneuploidy being not having the correct number of chromosomes. So she goes that into super detail um, about, you know, um, uh, testing that and whether you elect to test for that or not, the benefits um, of doing that. Um, and so really anyone can benefit from, from seeing a genetics counselor. Thanks, Lydia. A question um, just came in the chat. Do you need a referral to see a fertility specialist? 
Do you need a referral, did you say? Yes, do you need a referral oh. to uh, see a fertility specialist? No. It looks like those are all the questions that I can see, um, but something that you had answered made me kind of wonder myself, um, you know, thinking through what you had mentioned about optimizing, um, you know, glucose and body uh, BMI, et cetera. Is this kind of um, along the lines of why there are these quote ozempic babies happening? Uh, is it is that kind of in line with with what I've seen in the headlines about that? Yes, it is. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's not that Ozempic necessarily makes it easier to conceive, or I should say, uh, that's the tr the you know, the, or medications like that. It's more the optimizing of your BMI and Correct. glucose control. Got it. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully that may uh, may have myth busted some things um, that are out there. <laughs> Happy Thanks. to myth bust anytime. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dr. Gell and Lydia. It's wonderful to work with you, and I'm, I'm so grateful you were able to share this information with our community. Of course. Yes, and thank you, Dr. Gell. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Alyssa. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Um, we do have three minutes left, and I am gonna. There is a question that came in. So, Dr. Gail Lydia, if we can hang on to you for just a couple more minutes, one just sure. came through. Um, the question is: Do you recommend PGTA testing? Yeah. So, PGTA testing is that pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. Um, that's where we we take a small biopsy from um, each of the embryos. Um, embryos kind of are two different parts. There's one part that is the intracytoplasmic mass that it are, are cells destined to become baby. And then um, there's the other part, which is the trophoblastic cells, which are destined to become placenta. And so the PGTA is a biopsy of those placental cells so that we don't disrupt those baby cells. Um, it's a 99% accurate, you know, test um, to, you know, test the chromosomes of the baby. Um, and so, you know, if we know we have an embryo that has the correct number of chromosomes, you know, um, um, the chances of it being successful is much higher than, you know, if we don't know if it has the correct number of chromosomes or not. Um, you know, really, you know, recommended for women who are older than age 35 because, um, you know, the, the risks for having um, embryos that don't have the correct number of chromosomes increases. Um, and so it's, you know, situational and dependent um, kind of on your, your individual circumstances, but in general, um, it's recommended. I think the thing to remember about PGTA is that it's intended to be a screening test because you can have um, an embryo on day five that looks perfect, but that does not mean it has the correct number of chromosomes. So this testing was really developed to be a tool to best select an embryo that has the greatest likelihood of being able to attach and grow. And so that's the usefulness of it. And because as Lydia mentioned, in women who are 35 or older, the likelihood of having embryos that have the correct number of chromosomes starts to drop. It's a way to choose the embryo that has the greatest likelihood of attaching and growing normally. Okay, thank you so much for an answering that last question. And thank you to everybody for submitting the questions either via the live Q&A or prior to the program starting. Um, Dr. Gail, Lydia, I just wanna thank you one more time. Thank you both for sharing your time, sharing your information with everybody. I know we really appreciate it. Um, we will be, we did record the program. We will be sending a link out to everybody via email. So if there was anything that you missed or would like some more information or to share with anybody, we uh, recommend that you do so. Um, included in that email, will include information on how to connect with Dr. Gell and Lydia um, for more information. And we always invite you to go to our website, geisinger.org. There's a women's health tab and then a fertility page as well. So um, thanks everyone for joining this evening. Hope you got a lot of good information and we will, um, we will talk to you soon. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great evening.